thank you for your presence. We thank you for your visitation. We thank you for all the goodness that you have already shown us. And now lead us as we explore your word and uh, take over, Father, and give us your revelation and give us hearts and minds that are able to process your rich truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to invite you to go with me to the book of Ecclesiastes. And as you know, those who have been attending for the past few weeks, we've been engaged in this journey through the book of Ecclesiastes, which is a kind of a counterintuitive book. It's not a, an easily accessible book that just kind of bubbles over with joy that is obvious. Actually, it can be a grim book uh, as it begins with this uh, dictum that um, all is vanity. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And as you know well, Solomon takes uh, his sweet time in showing us all the reasons why we should get uh, depressed with this uh, failed world that we live in, uh, condemned to a dead end, sort of. And yet, as I've said earlier, um, out, of, out of that uh, diagnosis, out of that um, conclusion, that the world is kind of like a circular cell, as we saw in one of our sermons, uh, where you just kind of repeat the same things over and over again, where he says there's nothing new under the sun. And by the way, there's this expression, under the sun, meaning, uh, you know, the perspective of the man, the woman who doesn't know God, the man, the woman who is just, uh, you know, entombed in time and space, in history, in their own life, uh, and doesn't, is not able to look up beyond the sun into eternity, and so for that individual particularly, as we see, for example, in existentialism, this philosophy that is so 21st century that, uh, you know, it's, it's just no exit. It's one of the famous uh, plays by uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. This idea that we are in a cell, we can't get out, there's only silence, and the only thing that awaits us is just, or that redeems our life is this utter freedom that we have, uh, which is really an abyss it doesn't provide too much comfort for the individual that is just within reason and time and space. And so he speaks a lot about this uh, dead end of the world, this dark uh, diagnostic. But then surprisingly, out of that uh, conclusion, he extracts one of the most uh, impassioned calls to joy. And we've been uh, meditating on that. You know, surprisingly, over and over again, this dark, somber book calls us that pre to precisely because the world is a dark place um, and death ends it all in a way. And, uh, you know, all that we aspire to and struggle for and stressed out for in this world, at some point it comes to an end and, you know, the, uh, the, the reset button is uh, pressed. Precisely because of that, we should live joy, joyfully. Yes. We should live life meaningfully. So if you uh, look, for example, and we uh, read that verse uh, last Sunday, in chapter 9, Ecclesiastes, verse 7, 9, 7. It says, go, eat, therefore, after all this dark stuff that he goes through, he says, go, and it's almost like a, there's a therefore. Eat your bread with joy. Drink your wine with a merry heart. These are all metaphors of joy and enjoyment of life. For God has already accepted your works. And you remember that we talked about that last uh, Sunday. This approval of God. This preemptive approval. How many of us know as believers that we are approved definitively by God? You know that when you begin the Christian journey under the justice that Jesus Christ earned for all of us, you begin with a big A. In the exam and uh, whatever you do in life in your Christian journey that a that not just passing but excellent passing the test because Jesus Christ passed it for you and you are within that a then you, you cannot fail God approves of your work I, I think that Solomon when he wrote that wasn't even aware of how prophetic as so many times the, the writers of Scripture experienced. he was being he was speaking about that approval that we have earned through Christ, that salvation, that fullness of uh, acceptance that we have uh, experienced. And then he says, let your garments always be white and let your head lack no oil. Solomon, again, he was a poet, so he's using metaphors of how 
you know, how encompassing, how full our celebration of life. It's a call to celebration. Really, that major tone that uh, Solomon establishes in, in uh, Ecclesiastes is really what uh, has uh, drawn me to that book over and over again. This call to joy, which is, by the way, so New Testament. The words of the Apostle Paul ring in my ears. Rejoice. I say it again. Rejoice. And Paul is saying that literally in a cell. I mean, Solomon puts us in a kind of a cosmic cell. The world is a cell, and you're encased in it. Well, Paul was in a literal cell in a Roman jail. And yet somehow, out of that darkness that he finds himself in, he's able to give this call for all of us to rejoice. And that's really the the mystery of the gospel. The fact that we live in a fallen world, encased in a fallen body and a psychology, prone to fail God many, many times, uncertain about our ultimate, you know, ending in life, uh, knowing that, you know, as Jesus has said, you will find affliction in the world. But then, you know, the gospel always irrepressibly says also, but like Jesus says, in the world you will find affliction, you will find suffering, but take courage. I have vanquished the world. And that I have is also you have, I have, we have, through the power of Jesus Christ. So, you know, Scripture, over, scripture is very realistic. That's the thing that, that, that touches me about, um, you know, the, the gospel. When it is preached correctly, it doesn't negate, it doesn't uh, gloss over the dark periods, the struggles, the agonies, the failings, the sinful nature that we live in. But then it's able somehow to extract this uh, cry and this invitation to joy, to celebrate. And I've, I've, you, you've heard, I'm just uh, summarizing here so that those of you who are visiting, uh, who have come for the first time, understand where we're going here. Um, th- th- this joy that um, the Bible calls us to, to live joyful lives, to live lives of uh, celebration, even in the midst of our pain and of all the things that uh, would tell us that, no, you don't have a right to joy and you have no possibility of joy. Because you're too deep in a, in a rut. And somehow the gospel says no. I mean, it, it, the gospel acknowledges the pain of the human life and, you know, of believers. This, these rosy pictures that sometimes are painted for us about the Christian life, just an uninterrupted uh, series of major tones, major notes. I mean, there are, there's a lot of plays in in uh, the Christian life for minor tones, for minor keys to be played. But in the midst of that all, you know, what, it, what that does is it just makes our joy more sublime. It makes, it, more, it makes it more textured. It makes it much more dense and rich and, uh, you know, almost cosmic. The joy of the believer is a joy that has gone through a lot of dark moments and a, do- a lot of dark uh, visions. But then always out of that rises with the tone of... Uh, you know, blessing and joy. And so, so this, is the, this is the central um, element of um, the, uh, the, the book of uh, Ecclesiastes. And, you know, I made a point uh, yesterday, uh, Sunday about being intentional about living in that joy because the world will not give you that joy. Your nervous system will not allow you that joy, by the way. The tendency of the human being is to, you know, be anxious and uncertain, to doubt, to question to look at all the precedents for disaster and to let that be sort of the, the expectation for the future. And God says, no, you live joyfully. There's a call to joy that is there. And I'll, I'll get a little bit more about that. So, again, the, the point being, you know, out of this dark world, joy can be salvaged. And actually, that's the way we should live. And that call to joy should somehow have implications for everything that we do, how we work how we love, how we relate to others, how we process friendship, how we go about carrying out our careers or the struggles of life. There should be that beating call in your heart to uh, joy. And we should do it with determination. There's an ethic of joy that we should pursue. The enemy will try to kill your joy. The enemy will, you know, whisper how many times you have failed God. What a mess you've made of your life. How many times you've squandered wonderful opportunities. How undeserving you are of that joy and of that that treasure that God has for you. 
and uh, you have to resist that, those, those whisperings. And you have to hear that call to live in the joy that Jesus Christ has made possible. And, and so, um, you know, he says, always be clothed in white. Enjoy life with your wife whom you love all the days of this meaningless life. Enjoying life with your, uh, with your wife is life with your husband, life with your friends, life with your meaningful ones, life with your colleagues. It's just a enjoy. Be, be alert to those opportunities to exercise joy. And joy does need to be exercised, by the way. It's an act of the will. That God has given you under the sun all your meaningless days. And this is where I want to pick up. <clears throat> this morning, and here he says something that is very significant. It's easy to miss it. I have missed it for many years reading this book. For this, we're in verse 9, for this is your lot in life. This is your lot in life. I got stuck there because I think that's pregnant uh, with meaning. This is your portion. There's another, um, I believe it's the New King James uh, version. This is your portion in life. What, what does he mean by this? If you look, for example, at Lamentations uh, chapter 3, uh, verse uh, 24. Or let, let's look at Psalms. Let's just look at one, uh, one of these. Psalms 73, 26. My flesh and my heart may fail. See, that, that understanding of uh, frailty. We may fail God. We may have problems with our psychology. We may, uh, you know, it, it, it may entrap us. May but God... That's what enables Solomon to go from darkness to light. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Yeah, the, the book of Lamentations, you know, says something very similar. Uh, 324, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, my lot. Therefore, I will wait for him. So, uh, you know, this is the idea that uh, joy is our lot in life as believers. Uh, another, uh, the American, the New American Standard Bible states, for this is your reward. This is your reward in life. This is what you're supposed to do. This is your main and only thing. This is your destiny. Solomon in Ecclesiastes 5.18 says, this is what I have observed to be good, that it is appropriate for a person to eat to drink and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them, for this is their lot. In other words, this idea, you know, this is your mission. As a believer, you have to get in touch with your joy. Uh, you have to live an ethic of joy. This is something that, that you should not miss out on. I think many of us don't find joy in life because we don't realize that this, there's a call, there's a mission calling to enjoy life, to find ultimate peace and meaning and stability in the core of our being. It's, it's, it's it, this, this statement that he makes repeatedly over the whole book, and I do counsel you to continue reading the book as we go through it, you know, you may have possessions, you may have a great reputation, you may have made a lot of money, you, have, you may have become very successful in life, but if you have no joy at the center of your being, then, you know, unfortunately, it, it's a mess. Ecclesiastes 4, verses 7 and 8. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man, he's picturing all of a sudden, he's providing a metaphor for us. There was a man, a, a vision here, all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil. <clears throat> this is why I think if there's any book in the Bible that is 21st century, it is uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. It's written by a redeemed existentialist. Um, and, and because he has gone through this, he has seen all the possible expressions of life, and the good and the bad, the sublime, uh, the achievements, and so on and so forth. And he can speak with great authority. So he's, think, he's speaking about a man who may be himself at some point in his journey. There was no end to his toil. He's speaking to people who are driven, who are missions-oriented, who are A-types, control types. They want to make something of their life. They work hard. They come home at 12 o'clock at night because they've been toiling at the, at the office the entire day. They've been writing that paper until 4 o'clock in the morning. And they live like that, driven, compulsively, there was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. And then this is the fateful question that he asks himself. 
For whom am I toiling? He asked. And why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless. A miserable business. <laughs> you know, I, I think there's a point when you have to do kind of a check on your life and say, you know, for whom am I toiling? What is the meaning of what I'm doing? Why am I killing myself? Am I finding joy, meaning, purpose, stability in the core uh, in what I am doing? And then uh, Ecclesiastes 6, verse 1 to 3. I have seen another evil under the sun, and it weighs heavily on mankind. God gives some people wealth, possessions, and honor so that they lack nothing their hearts desire. But God does not grant them the ability to enjoy them. And strangers enjoy them instead. This is meaningless. A grievous evil. How many people out there, and maybe some of us here, would fit that image? Because it doesn't have to be, you know, a CEO of a large company. Um, it can be your own work, you know, in a factory. It may be your motherhood. Uh, it may be being a housewife. It may be driving Uber. And we have to uh, check on ourselves periodically in life and say, you know, how's it going, brother or sister? Are you enjoying life? I mean, and, and, you know, the, I'll point it out maybe uh, prematurely. The joy that the Bible uh, calls us is not, uh, you know, this easy, facile, uh, fun. It's something that has gone through the, the meteorite shower of uh, struggle doubt, self-questioning, and somehow is able to move through onto the other side. And so we have to ask ourselves continually, you know, how's, how's it going? How's my joy? How's my meaning? Because again, it's not just about joy in the emotional sense of the word. I think meaning is a more authenticity, satisfaction in the deep sense of the word. A man may have a hundred children, verse 3, and live many years, yet no matter how long he lives, if he cannot enjoy his prosperity, and he adds, and does not receive a proper burial. This is the poet in him. I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. You know, it's all about that. Believers uh, measure life and excellence and success in a very different way than the man, or, uh, the woman on the street. We, we have to always, whatever you do, and I speak to the young people here who, who are right now listening particularly, it's a good time when you're young to commit yourself to paths with heart. That, that's an expression that's not mine. Uh, in, the, in the famous series in the 70s, and I'm dating myself here when I was in college, you know, the, this, uh, uh, the Don Juan series, read about it. It's not Don Juan, the Don Juan of uh, Italian literature. It's Don, Don Juan of uh, some peyote uh, chewing uh, Indian in, in the, one of the deserts of New Mexico. It's an interesting book, a series of books, by the way. But, you know, Don Juan tells his mentee, Carlos, you know, choose a path with heart. And I think it's, it's an important thing, you know, because if you live your life just doing things because, you know, your parents want you to be a doctor, they want you to, you know, make the money and sort of redeem the family name, um, and you're doing it because of that, then something's wrong. What you, as you live life, it has to have meaning. It has to have substance. It has to be the path of a warrior. You, you have to live life uh, and have the courage to choose that which gives you meaning. Solomon is saying that at the end of the day, the work that we do in life should allow us, at the very least allow us, and really, if not outright, produce in us joy, fulfillment, a sense of purpose in life. Without that, it's all meaningless. Uh, vanity of vanities. It's a waste of time. I, I want to stress that. In, in other words, our basic assignment in life, the main reward for all our efforts, should be happiness and enjoyment of life in the fullness of what those terms uh, mean. Because I'm not talking again, you know, hakuna matara, you know, just uh, don't worry, be happy. That's, no, no, no. Christianity, the, the, the happiness, the joy goes through the cross. It's the happiness of Sunday resurrection that has gone through the, you know, the depth of the tomb, the darkness of uh, internment in uh, the abyss. And that then has seen God uh, raise us from the dead 
and then can really, it's, you know, it's that, uh, as the Bible says, uh, Jesus, because of the blessing that was put before him, went through the cross. You know, there's always the cross. The cross is the kind of what we call the bookmark of, um, of the Christian life. It is there, you know, in the background always, but then giving uh, our expression of joy um, extraordinary value and power. If we work day after day and we kill ourselves making money, pursuing a career, and we're not deriving joy or meaning in our work or in life, then we need to re-examine our priorities and have the courage to transfer our energies someplace else because there will be a price. It sounds simplistic, but our main assignment uh, in life is to find true joy. And ultimately, that joy can only be found through Jesus Christ, knowing that eternity awaits us, knowing that everything that we are doing here is preliminary. It's just a, a rehearsal. It's just a, an enactment of mysteries before God. But that what, really has, what truly has meaning is what lies at the end, that eternal life. And it'll be something that we cannot even imagine how rich it will be. We should not find ourselves killing ourselves at work, stressing out, sometimes feeling exploited, living a dry, sterile life, and be content with that day after day. If you're a student, put whatever you want in there. But there has to be more. We need to have the courage to pursue meaning in life and in what we do. It's not enough just to make money, have a reputation, succeed in that little enclosure that you find yourself in. You have to break through that and see from the 360-degree perspective of God. If our activities and our work are not providing some level of joy or meaning for us, then something is fundamentally wrong. We need to re-examine our life and ask ourselves whether we are investing our efforts correctly. Uh, so there's this thing about our lot in life. In other words, hey, this is your destiny. This is your calling. This is the main thing in your life. But, you know, he expands on that. This idea that joy is our lot in life, our reward, you know, it introduces something else. You know, if you really examine that deeply, it says to me that joy is my inheritance. This, it's your portion in life. Joy is my birthright. It should be. In other words, this is an important distinction there. It has, I think, logical, philosophical significance. I can identify with that. You know, your birthright, your right as a believer is to have the joy of the Lord. Joy is my natural destiny. It is my default position, if you will. Both here on earth and in the coming life, Christ has taken away the sting of death and the victory of the grave. And therefore, I can rejoice while I am in this world because this is what I am. This child that has been recreated by Christ is born with the document that says, joy is yours for the taking. That's my birthright, made possible by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. You know, what, what consequences come out of that recognition? If through Christ my right is to live joyfully, then that changes everything. Because then what I have to do is to, you know, remove all the obstacles that prevent my pre-existent, I said preemptively declared joy from uh, manifesting itself. Remove. Because I mind, somebody asked, uh, I think it was uh, Michelangelo, you know, having done this extraordinary statue, executed it, and they were wondering how could he, how, how was it possible to, pr to produce such a sublime sculpture, piece of sculpture? And he said, you know, all I did, I, I removed all the excesses that prevented this beauty from manifesting itself. In other words, he took that block of marble, he, he had in mind what was encased in it. It was beauty, it was sublimity. He just took out all the excess, and there it was. And I think that's the, the idea. You know, when you, when you assume that joy is encased within you, that you have this germ of joy pulsating within you, you have this embryonic presence of joy. It's there. It comes with the birthright. And all you have to do is just take out the details, you know, remove the, the dictates of your nature, my nature, the anxiety, the stress, the self-doubt, the self-condemnation, the darts of the enemy that say you don't have a right to that. It's not possible to achieve that. Remove all of those things because the joy is in there already. It's not like you have to create the joy or, or get the joy. It's rather discover the joy within you. 
It's the gifting of God in you. I think, it, does that make a difference? It makes it to me. Because all I have to do then is uh, just rescue what is my portion. I think, and, and the Bible always speaks in those terms. Uh, Paul says to Timothy, I command you or I commit you to fan into flame the gift of God, what? That is within you. It is in, it's within us. You know, the, the blessing of God, the power of God, the agency of God is within us already. We just have to say, Lord, I have it. I've received it. You've given it to me. Now I move in it. And then you begin taking small steps of joy or taking small steps of gifting, believing that you have it. And all, all you have to do now is fan it into flame. That means that you have a responsibility. You know, you have to take uh, the, the busy, the extra busy businessman or the extra busy student has to, um, at some point, actively, heroically put down the books or uh, close uh, the, the legal documents that he's dealing with and say, you know what, I'm going to spend some hours with my wife. I'm going to go out and have a good meal. I'm going to take a jog. I'm going to sit down and repair my nervous system. I'm going to have some time of meditation with the Lord. I'm going to take a nice walk. I'm going to smell the roses in my life. That's what Sabbath is all about, by the way. Sabbath is the most courageous thing that you can do. And that's why God made it a command in a way because our tendency is not to celebrate Sabbath. Our tendency is, you know, there's a, a, still one mountain of dishes to wash, a bunch of clothes to press, one more uh, piece of homework to do. And, and all of that, you know, is, is those obstacles, that, that piece of stone that prevents the joy that is in you from manifesting itself. And you have to take a risk. And you have to almost see yourself putting down the book, putting down the, the, the corporate report, and saying, my lot, I have a right to spend time with my family. I have a right to cultivate the relationship with my son or daughter. I have a right to take them out to a ball game or to a movie. I have a right to take care of my body. I have a right to spend time with the Lord. This is my birthright. This is my lot. And I, I have to do it. Because it's, it's within me. Because, it, you know, uh, all of you and all of, and I, including me, we're all gifted when we come into the kingdom, I mean, there's a huge package of blessings and benefits that are given to us invisibly, but very real. I mean, we, we become pregnant with the life of God, and we're walking around with this big belly, and you, we just don't see it. It's full of life. And what we have to do is just uh, kind of uh, process it, develop it, live in, in the belief that it is there. And you have to take steps believing that it is there. You have to take small steps. If you, don't, if you don't take those small steps toward joy, toward meaning, it will not unfold. And what happens is that as you take those small steps, you realize that, wow, this works. The world doesn't fall because I, I didn't, you know, go to bed at 5 o'clock in the morning. It's still around. That's what the Sabbath says. And then you realize, okay, so I can take a little bit more and a little bit more. And then you find that balanced life of joy where you work hard as heck. But you also enjoy life. And, you know, finding that balance, that's the thing. I want to talk a little bit about that before I'm through here. If through Christ my right is to live joyfully, then that changes everything. Now, here's, I, I want to step into actually truly new territory. Look at uh, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10. Because this is part of his own meditation on joy. He just expands it a little bit more now. So he says, rejoice, enjoy life, and so on. And look what he says in verse 10, following that obvious call to joy. He says, whatever your hand finds to do. I, I love that. Again, the, the, the imagery of the, of, the, of the poet. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. I want you to take that verse and make it a, an emblem, a mantra for your life. And again, this is a man who has just spent uh, hundreds of words depressing us with his uh, diagnostic of, uh, you know, this dead-end world that we live in. And yet he's saying, you know, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. 
And, and the, you know, the other side of Solomon is not too far away ever. For in the grave where you are going, <laughs> it's, you know, he's always working with those two, those two elements. There is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. That's a very mysterious thing. I don't have time to get into how the, you know, ancients saw Sheol and all of that. That's another, that's for another time because we'll get lost. Um, and it's very biblical as well, what he's seeing there and so on. No need to say, well, this is a contradiction, you know. Um, this is, whatever your heart, your hand that finds to do, do it with all your heart. Solomon continues and expands this call to joy by inserting an invitation to immerse ourselves fully in whatever we do. Full immersion. You know, because as I said earlier, it is possible for this invitation to joy, just uh, enjoy the woman of your life, all your life, never lack white garments, oil on your head, and so on and so forth. It's, about, it's possible for, for this invitation to joy to be interpreted as just, you know, have fun. Enjoy life. Don't take anything seriously because the world is messed up anyway. You know, just go from place to place like a dilettante and, you know, like a little bird, uh, you know, or bee. Enjoy the flower, different flowers and the tastes. And don't stay too long for anything because it's all a mess anyway. Don't worry. Be happy. Just, you know, try different things. No. Instead, Solomon is counseling us to live life intentionally, mark that word, live life intentionally with a sense of purpose, being fully committed to and making sure that whatever we do, we do it with excellence, giving it our full attention. Again, it reminds me of uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 17 and 23, because it's all the Holy Spirit speaking thousands of years uh, between or several hundred and uh, 317, 23 Colossians says, again, echoing, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the, in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And then verse 23, he says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. It's the same thing. How practical is that? He says, as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. I think one of the reasons why we should live life so powerfully, so intentionally, so focused, is because we have this extraordinary witness, this observer, this reader of our life, um, being either honored or shamed or embarrassed by how we live our life. And he's our great audience and in moments of great agony, in moments of great suffering, in moments of failure, we should know that every experience in our life is redeemed by this observer, that we have this audience of one, with a capital A, audience of one. And, uh, you know, no matter how lost you may think you are in your own privacy, the privacy of your agony, your failure, your sinfulness, uh, whatever it is, you know, God, like any great writer, is not uh, scandalized by your sin, by your smallness. Uh, you know, one of my very favorite verses, Psalm 103, as the father has compassion for his children, so does God have compassion for those who fear him. For he knows our frame. That's the Old Testament, the, the King James. For he knows our frame. He knows that we are but dust. Even as we live out all these dark moments of our life, know that they're redeemed by the fact that you're not living it alone. You have, the, at the very least, if, a, if God is watching, it has meaning. Philosophers have this uh, um, question that they ask many, you know, it's, it's a question that has pursued philosophy for, long, for many centuries. If a tree falls in a forest and no one hears it, does it make a noise? I, I would answer, of course it does, because God is hearing it. God is always the, the witness in everything that you do, however you live your life. And, and so whatever you do in life, you've got to do it for this audience of one. Amen. You have to do it for this great joy, you know, and for, for these this, this eyes that are watching you. You should live life fully, intentionally. Do it with all your might because you're acting for an amazingly sophisticated audience. 
as part of this ethic of joy, Solomon invites us to remain focused in whatever we do, to embrace it fully. We should never do our work in a distracted, half-hearted sort of way. Rather, we should be fully committed to it, giving it our best. I maintain that Christians should be the best employees in the world. They should be the best fathers and mothers. They should be the best leaders. And I don't want to put too much pressure on you. They should be the best human beings in the world. And this should be so not only because we have the mind of Christ that helps us to, you know, know what that means and that enables us to excel in the things that we undertake, but also because as Christians, we are called to live a life of determination and purpose, to live life according to a pre-established vision that we have established for ourselves of excellence and greatness in whatever sphere of life we are engaging I think when you live life according to a vision, that changes everything. And this, this has to be a vision of greatness. I, and I mean all of us here, every one of us here, because we have defined specifically what it is that we want to become. And then we pursue it with determination and with the help of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to put Michael on the spot here. And uh, I think I read something ages ago when, when you were coming to uh, Gordon College and if it's not true, then it makes for a great story, and it's, it's perfect anyway. But, you know, it, it said that uh, Michael, when he was a young man, he, he set himself a vision for becoming a college president. He wanted to become a college president. There was no hubris in that. I think, you know, you should aspire to great things in life. And then he pursued, he has pursued this challenge throughout the years. He apprenticed with a, a college president uh, before He has written books, uh, one of them uh, Pulitzer Prize nominated on leadership. He has interviewed hundreds of leaders throughout his lifetime. And then one day he finds himself before a board of trustees interviewing for the presidency of one of the premier Christian colleges in the nation and doing an extraordinary job by, by all accounts. But, you know, this idea, this morning, when I, as I reflected on this, it came to my mind, you know, that you have to set yourself a plan. And it should be an ambitious plan because a true a godly ambition glorifies God because it says, I am a product of this powerful spirit that dwells in me. Therefore, I can aspire to do great things. But then you have to set yourself a, a vision. What is it you want to do? It may be something as, as uh, you know, I don't know what the word would be, but as uh, simple as I just want to live a successful life. I want to be a successful human being. I want God to look at me and to take joy in my character, in the way, my way of being. I, 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 I told myself I wasn't going to use this uh, image, but I will anyway, this example. I have two daughters. We have two daughters. <clears throat> And I hope they, when I finish, if they see the video, they'll feel good about what I'm going to say here. But, you know, I have two daughters, Sonia and Abigail. You know them. And, uh, you know, Sonia is the quintessential um, professional woman. You know, Harvard and Yale uh, School of Business, uh, lives in Europe with her husband. And, you know, she has she's always wanted to, she learned to cook late in life because that was, she was not interested in that. And has become actually a good cook. Um, maybe a chef, I should say. I don't want to offend her too much. But anyway, you know, she, she has adopted that ethic, you know, and she has become good at what she does. Abigail, since she was a little girl, wanted to be a mom and a wife. And, uh, you know, that, that was her calling. That she, she has lived according to that and has three beautiful children who are the delight of our eyes. And also Abby and, and her husband, you know. Not, not, um, and, uh, you know, but Abby's call, she's a nurse, lives in Nashville with her musician husband. Her, her calling is uh, being an excellent mom. And I, I, I would say, you know, grandfatherly pride aside that her three kids are her masterpiece. Those are her books. Those are her great achievements and her being a, a wonderful woman, full of the grace and the character of Christ in her and a pursuer of excellence. Sonia has taken a different path. You know, uh, they, to the world, uh, you know, they may seem like one is better than another or whatever, but before God, they, they, they both, they're both paths with heart. They're both paths of excellence. When you live your life authentically, according to a, a vision that you have established for yourself, and you pursue it day by day, aligning all the areas of your life, every decision that you make, every small conversation, your moments of rest, what you read, what you watch on TV or in a movie, what you consume 
through literature or through experiences. You're living with a vision in mind. I'm going to live a life that is meaningful. I'm going to, and then you set yourself an agenda of achieving that. It may be, again, being a housewife, it may be being the president of a corporation, maybe being president of the United States. It doesn't matter. The thing is, do not waste your life. Do not waste your gifting. Make sure that when you die, when the music stops, you have wrung every amount of beauty and greatness from your life. That you have extracted every ounce of gifting and blessing. You've left the world slightly better. As a, result of, as a result of your living. You know, much of what really moves the heart of God and what changes the world is not what we say, what we do visibly or perceptibly. It's about the energy that emanates from us. The way we bless the world, simply the greatness of who we are. Small interventions that sometimes we're not even aware of. And that's what you have to work for, that path of, with heart. Getting to that point of critical mass of goodness inside of you. Whatever it is that you do, do it with all your heart. Do it with all your might. If you have the spirit of Christ in you, then you can do truly all things. <clears throat> you set high goals for yourself. You, you don't allow yourself too many cheap excuses. Wherever you go, you know you represent the kingdom of God. And you know that you have to represent it well. You know, and in the end, you don't, you don't obsess or stress about this because you know that even if you fail to hit the bullseye, you are already approved. Your works are approved. You have an A. Remember that? You're moving within the A. And God will be delighted with your efforts. He has already accepted you. Even if you're not entirely successful, you cannot fail. The one thing that we can fail at is not trying, not uh, uh, receiving the vision. You know, there's many of us here who feel, man, I'm, I'm too deep in the rut. I... Uh, you know, to call me, you know, there some of us, it's a challenge just to aspire to having a, a home that we can live in, an apartment. I, I wish I could uh, get inside of you for a moment. I wish you could read my conviction that housing is just a minor thing for you to aspire to. It can, it will, it, God can do that in a thousand things more. There are a thousand more victories Actually, I told the congregation the other day, there's no better place for a believer to find themselves in than in the hole, deep inside the hole, or in a dead end with the Indians coming at you. Maybe that's not politically correct, but you know what I mean. And, uh, you know, I, I spoke about Jehoshaphat uh, attacked by the Moabites, and, and uh, you know, they cannot possibly win and uh, somehow the Holy Spirit extracts this expression from Jehoshaphat that has been emblematic for me. Lord, we do not know what to do. And so we turn our eyes to you. Amen. You know, I've said that that is the, the best place for a believer to be in. With, with the emergency brake fully pulled back and you cannot move no matter how much you press the accelerator. And then to cry out to the Lord. If you don't know what to do, that's great. Because then God can show all his greatness. If you don't know how to, you know, assemble your life, if you don't have the pieces of the engineering well uh, defined, wonderful. God delights in taking us when we don't know how to, you know, work out this great life that he wants us to live. To live. And having, been, having invited him, he says, ah, now I can do something extraordinary. Now I can get the glory. Don't let anybody steal your joy. The, uh, Satan is the kill joy par excellence. Just, just knowing that you are not dependent on, on, on your own strength as you seek to live that life of mindfulness and excellence, but that you have the powerful spirit of God within you working on your behalf should be the source of energy and confidence for you. It should be a stimulus to pursue excellence and greatness in whatever you do. One last piece of a uh, meditation here you know I, I mentioned the word mindfulness this is a concept that is very popular these days in education in the world of business it's actually borrowed from Buddhism and it has this implication of being present in the moment this idea whatever you do do it with all your might that brings to my mind this idea of mindfulness being present in the moment pay attention to what you are experiencing in the moment in which you are existing 
rather than having your mind wandering about without fully engaging in what you're doing. Whatever you do, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, all your concentration. Think about what you are doing. Be intentional. Many of us are so distressed by the past and by the future that we squander the opportunity to live in the present, fully focused, committed, engaged. We are either tortured and persecuted by past failures, traumas, and sins that we have committed, or we are equally distracted by the yearnings for what we do not have yet, what we have not yet accomplished, the future that we have not attained, or ourselves even. So we neglect to enjoy the present. And life passes us by, and we squander the possibility of enjoying our loved ones, our marriages, good friendship, or just a good movie or a play in this vain life that we are living. Somebody has said that when, you, when you're de- uh, the, you know, in your deathbed, you don't lament not having had more time to work or spend more hours at the office. What you lament is perhaps not having told your child, hey, I love you, or, or spend more time with your wife or husband or, you know, taking better care of yourself you know sometimes you you imagine you know I I see this all the time especially young the younger types we're having dinner with a significant other and there we are toying with our cell phone while we nibble at our food rather than engaging the person that we have in front of us and enjoying their company fully and enjoying the moment for all it's worth this is mindfulness whatever you're doing if you're in the moment savor the moment If you're a student, savor your studenthood. If you're a mom, enjoy your momhood. If you're an athlete, work hard, play hard. Be mindful of the moment. Don't squander opportunities. If that child comes into your office, take care of him. Give him your time and then leave what you're doing. Focus on, I wish we had more time to uh, develop this idea, mindfulness concentration, deliberation, intentionality. Whatever situation you're facing right now, whatever obstacles are in your way to becoming that powerful human being that God wants you to become, I urge you to set for yourself the highest goal and then to pursue it mightily and with a mixture of determination and trust of total effort and total yielding to God. I leave you with the words of Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Philippians 3. Brothers and sisters, that's you, Congregation Lion of Judah, that's me. I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, whatever your goal is in life, whatever greatness you're pursuing. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead with full determination, full decision. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I pray that the Lord will help us today, tomorrow, always live like that. The prize is joy. The prize is greatness. The prize is excellent. The prize is a meaningful relationship with Christ. The prize is illuminating the world even briefly with your life and your excellence. The prize is finding meaning as you live and you walk through this path with heart. The prize is becoming Christ-like. The prize is reflecting the excellence, the greatness, the beauty of the kingdom of God in whatever place you find yourself in. Now strain for that in in a, in a godly way, trusting that you will achieve it as you go. There's no failure possible for the believer empowered by the Holy Spirit. Would you bow your head with me? Father, your words are seeds of life and they fall within our sensibilities and then they do what is according to their nature, regardless of us many times. And we appeal to that life that is in your word this morning that has gone into us. I pray that we'll be able to remember, even if we don't remember, the, the, the seeds of life in it. Disseminate, distribute the life in your words through each of us here this morning. We want to live. We want to be pleasing unto you, Father. And we want to enjoy this world that you have put us in 
and then we revel and we thank you because it's just the beginning when we go through the threshold we go to the other side eternal inexpressible uncontaminated joy awaits us and then we will be fully realized and we thank you because as your children we are on a journey that is absolutely successful unlike any other we have earned the a we have passed the test already may our brothers and sisters find consolation and hope and a reason to celebrate in your words this morning in jesus name amen and amen